I used to be a strategy player who entered a book world, but unexpectedly, I failed the task and was sent back to the real world by the system. Just when I got married and had children, gradually forgetting this experience, the system came to find me again. It said, if you don't return, your son will soon break free from control and become the greatest villain of this book. Chapter 1. I hadn't contacted the system for years. It reappeared this time when I was returning from the amusement park with Hannah and our daughter. Mary was holding my hand, pestering me to get McDonald's for dinner. I was just about to tell her not to eat too many burgers when suddenly, a familiar electronic buzzing sound rang in my ears. Then came the system's mechanical voice. Host. Long time no see. Looking at our harmonious little family, it seemed to choke up, not knowing how to continue. So, do you remember the task from back then? Since you left, the target's mental state has been declining, and now it's very unstable. Also, your son from back then has been clamoring to see you. Could you go back and see the two of them? Chapter 2. I was stunned. It's almost impossible for me to forget that part of my life. Back then, I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, with less than three years to live. During the most painful part of my treatment, I was bound to this strategy system. I entered a tragic romance novel where the task was to win over the deep-hearted second female lead. She was the only daughter of the Lou family, a rich heiress. Her parents had arranged a marriage for her, but she insisted on marrying the male lead, a poor man, refusing to marry anyone else. As a result, she became a stumbling block in the main couple's relationship and ended up with a tragic fate. So my task was to make her give up on the entanglement with the male and female leads and agree to marry me. My mission would be complete. I could choose to stay in that identity forever. Because if I returned to my original world, I wouldn't have much time left. So I cherished this chance. When the second female lead, Willow, was abandoned by the male lead, I often comforted her, chatted with her, took her out for walks, and prepared small surprises for her, sometimes a bouquet of flowers, a book that matched her mood, or her favorite coffee or dessert. In my original world, I used to carve wood, so I often made her little pendants. It became a habit from little things, and she got used to having me around. She said her favorite was the delicate rosewood rose pendant I made, so she always wore it around her neck, gradually. Her attitude toward me softened, turning from cold to gentle and dependent. I thought I had changed the course of the story, and we would fall in love and marry. However, things didn't go as planned. When I went to the hospital for a checkup at the system's request, I accidentally ran into Willow, who was just coming out of the obstetrics department, beaming with joy. But the moment she saw me, her face turned pale with fear, confused. I only caught a glimpse of her hurriedly stuffing something into her bag. My mind was in chaos, unable to connect her actions to any meaning but I instinctively felt something was off. I hesitated to speak because the crowd around us was too noisy, so I waved at her, signaling her to come home with me. The moment the car door closed, she started explaining. It turned out that after a drunken night together, she had accidentally gotten pregnant with my child. She told me she had decided to keep the baby because, in her view, once a child is conceived, it's already a life. Her morals wouldn't allow her to abort it, as it would be equivalent to killing her own child. I thought this decision meant she would accept my proposal. So I took out the ring I had long prepared, but she suddenly grew cold and said, George, my parents will never agree to our marriage. You have no status, no background. If I tell them about this, they'll force me to have an abortion. Please don't push me. Okay. Maybe after the baby is born, and things are settled, they'll have no choice but to accept it. Listening to her excuse, I nodded in agreement. Chapter 3. That was my first child. His name was David. Becoming a father for the first time. The excitement and joy were indescribable. Maybe because my father was an alcoholic who not only neglected me but also took out his frustrations on me whenever he lost money gambling. So, I put a lot of effort and energy into raising David to be a talented person. Sometimes he made me angry, but no matter how furious I got, I never laid a finger on him. I always believed that children were not my possessions. Like me, they were equal human beings. At the Lou family, I was often looked down upon, simply because in the book world, I was a nobody. The Lu family was an influential, wealthy clan. To them, I was just some random guy who deceived their daughter, trying to use the Lu family to climb up in life. Willow was their only daughter. Although they hated me, they still valued David as Willow's son. So, they had a clear attitude of keeping the child, but discarding the father. Every weekend, they would take David to the Lu family's old mansion so his grandparents could see him. By the time he turned one, he already had his first personal bank account. At three or four years old, while I still took taxis to pick him up, David could already tell the difference between a Rolls Royce and a Cullinan by the interior. By the time he was five or six, I would sit him on my lap and teach him addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But he threw down the pen, looking up at me, he asked, 
Grandpa says I'll inherit the Liu family's company in the future. So since I'm going to inherit the company anyway, why do I need to learn this stuff? What's the point? He paused and then continued. Also, Dad, why is my last name Wang? You're just a worker, a poor nobody. Other than being my dad, what use are you to the Liu family? I might as well take the Liu family's last name. I never imagined such words would come out of a child's mouth. Stunned for a while, David might have noticed the change in my expression. He softly added, that's what grandpa told me. No matter how much I love this child, as a man, being humiliated like that by my own son, I couldn't help but speak more sternly. I said, David, you can have any last name you want. That's your freedom. I don't care if you want to be Wang or Lu. I'll respect you. But I also ask that you respect me. As your father, I've never treated you poorly. I raised you without expecting anything in return. I never thought about what use you'd be to me. I raised you simply because you're my son. At that moment, I felt a wave of emotion. I recalled the despair I felt in the hospital corridor, waiting for the results, with each second feeling like waiting for death. At that time, I even thought living was worse than dying, that it would be better to just end it all and stop the suffering. So when I was lying there, struggling through painful treatments, I had thought of the same question. So I said, and David, you just said you'll inherit the company, so why learn anything? But I want to ask you, since people will die anyway, why struggle to keep living? That time, I talked a lot. David cried his heart out, Willow couldn't bear it, so she took him back to the Lu family. Mother and son didn't come back for a long time. The next time I saw them, months had passed. I brought some homemade food and went to the old mansion to pick David up, wanting to tell him that his father shouldn't have spoken so harshly last time, but then I saw him get out of a black luxury car. He was holding Willow's hand with one hand and another man's hand with the other. In a soft, sweet voice, he said, Uncle Makoto, will you marry my mom? My mom and dad aren't married yet, so you can marry her. Chapter 4 I stood there holding the lunchbox, frozen. Makoto was the male lead of this world. After all the twists and turns, he had come back. He curled his lips into a smile, glanced at Willow, and teased. Why, don't you want your mom and dad to be together? David hesitated for a moment before answering. But, Grandpa doesn't like dad, and my mom doesn't like dad either. Willow only furrowed her brows slightly and didn't say a word. I should have seen this coming because in the original book, there was a scene where Willow drugged the male lead and took him to a hotel room. The next morning, after they woke up, she cried, asking him to take responsibility. Later, she even pretended to be pregnant to force him to marry her. So when I saw her panicked face at the hospital, I had a vague idea of what was going on. She wanted to use my child, a real pregnancy, to force the male lead to marry her, but she didn't expect me to stumble upon it. Even so, while pregnant, she still fantasized about reuniting with the male lead one day refusing to accept my proposal, but I still clung to a bit of a foolish hope, thinking things would get better, but they didn't. The deeply affectionate second female lead would always be drawn to the male lead. Even her child was no exception. I looked utterly ridiculous in comparison. I didn't say a word to anyone. I just turned and left. That night, I reactivated the system. I'm giving up on this task. I'm going home. Chapter 5. The system was quite shocked by my decision to give up on the task. Host. Why? Even if the target doesn't marry you, you could still stay here, as long as she doesn't marry anyone else, you can remain here forever. I remembered what David said to Makoto with his head raised. I laughed self-deprecatingly. In fact, now that the male lead has returned, with Willow's personality, she'd probably choose to be with him anyway, right? I might as well go back to reality. Maybe if I seek treatment early, I can live a few more years. Seeing me like this, the system, usually mechanical and indifferent, let out a sigh. I understand. Host, please wait a moment. I'll submit a request to my superiors to see if we can help you. It was a night before the system came back. This time, its voice was much more excited. Host, my request has been approved. You can go home. Back to the moment you first crossed into the book. I used the points you earned from the tasks here, along with some points I saved up myself. I exchanged them for a healthy body for you, so when you return, your cancer will be cured. Don't worry. I was stunned and asked instinctively. You used your points too, won't that cause you trouble? The system hummed. It's fine, we need to maintain a good relationship with our hosts anyway. You never know, we might need your help again someday. Chapter 6, as agreed. After returning to the real world, the system cured my cancer. I lived like a normal person. I met someone I loved, who also loved me. We had another child. The system never appeared again, until today. Its voice sounded dejected. The thing is, that boy, David is showing signs of turning dark. He's around 12 or 13 years old now, but he's unnervingly mature for his age, solitary, with no friends. We're worried that he might grow up to become a villain. 
So we're asking you, host, could you go back and stay with him for a month? I thought back to when I gave up on the task. If it weren't for the system using its own points to help me with my request to the superiors, I might not have survived until now. So even though I really didn't want to return to that world, I decided to agree. But, I said, I need to discuss this with my wife first. After all, I'm married now. The system immediately responded. Yes, yes, I'll wait. My wife Hannah knew about this experience. She's an illustrator. She's also my employee. Before we got together, I had told her everything about my experience in the book world. So when she heard the word system, she didn't look surprised. She just paused for a moment while chopping vegetables. She looked at me, her breathing a bit uneven. Honey, are you going back? You won't, not come back, right? Chapter 7 Her voice trembled at the last few words. I smiled. Of course not. The system said it's just for a month, and there's no mission this time. So no matter what, I won't stay there. Just as I finished speaking, the kitchen door suddenly opened. Mary rushed in, grabbing my sleeve. Daddy, where are you going? Are you leaving me? Don't you want me anymore? I froze. Then I burst into laughter, picked her up, and ruffled her hair. How could I? You're my darling. I could never leave you behind. But the little one didn't believe me. In my arms, Mary shook her head vigorously, tugging at my sleeve as if afraid I'd disappear in the next moment. But I heard it. You told mom that you're going to a faraway place and to meet another kid. Daddy, is it because I insisted on having a burger tonight? She seemed on the verge of tears. I won't be naughty anymore. I won't ask for McDonald's or KFC. Daddy, please don't leave. Chapter 8 I had never told Mary about David. I always thought there was no need for a child to know. The past should remain in the past. But now. Seeing Mary's sad expression. I suddenly realized that maybe it wasn't right to think of children as completely clueless. Telling them the truth might be the correct approach. I sighed. Holding her shoulders. I said slowly. Actually. Daddy has another child. He's your brother. And he hasn't seen me for a long time. This time. I'm just going back to celebrate his birthday. And then I'll come back. Okay. After a while. Mary nodded. She didn't fully understand. But she said. Then I want to go too. I want to meet this brother. Okay, daddy. Chapter 9. I was silent. It wasn't impossible, but, I summoned the system, is this allowed? The system seemed to have given up, willing to accept any condition as long as I agreed to return. It's fine. Two people, then two people. After all, it's just a child. Nothing too chaotic should happen. It pulled out something resembling a phone from its storage space and tossed it in front of me. David's birthday is in a month. Please take care of him during this time. When the month is up, just press this phone, and you'll be able to return. The system paused. Is that okay? Mary had no more objections. I finally looked at Hannah. She had been leaning against the wall, staring at her toes, sensing my gaze. She lifted her head and looked me in the eye. George, I only have one request. If you must go, make a deal with the system. If something happens and you can't return in a month, give me a chance. Let me go there, contact you, and find you. Chapter 10. I returned to the world of the book again. The system placed Mary and me in the same place where I had left, a modern apartment complex in the city center. Since I was only staying for a short time, finding a new job would have been troublesome. The system had conveniently rented the same house I used to live in. It's Unit 728. I noticed the place had been empty for years, so I went ahead and signed the lease. You don't mind, do you? Why would I? I shook my head and said. It's fine, but when I entered the house, it didn't feel like it had been vacant for years. It felt as if it had been frozen in time giving me the eerie sensation of stepping back into the past. The room was clean and tidy, and even the arrangement of the furniture hadn't changed. The slippers I left behind were still in the shoe cabinet. A dried bouquet sat in the vase by the window, and on the table was the unfinished wood carving I had been working on. It was a gift I had been preparing for David. A greedy little squirrel with its face already carved, its chubby cheeks and clever eyes resembling how David looked when he was born, small, curled up like a ball. David was my first child and my only link to this strange world. I could never forget the moment the nurse handed him to me, the feeling of becoming a father. Besides the joy and novelty, there was also an overwhelming sense of responsibility I had never known before. I always believed that a father must raise his child to succeed, just as a writer shouldn't abandon a story halfway through, and a sculptor must pour all their energy into completing their work, it seemed only natural. But how does an author continue writing a story that has been rejected by its subject? Once, Willow had a fight with me and returned to her parents' home. She left the babbling child behind, completely ignoring him. So, during that time, it was mostly just David and me. The first word he learned to say was dad. The first full sentence he spoke, lifting his chubby little hands, was, dad, I like you, but later, 
How did things end up like this? David grew to resent me, yet inexplicably adored Willow, but I never told him that Willow didn't like him at all. On the day he was born, when people congratulated her on having a boy, she said in front of everyone, Congratulations, what for? This obsession with boys over girls, I don't care about that, I don't like boys, I prefer girls. I could understand her thoughts. When Willow was little, her parents often remarked that it would have been better if she were a boy, so the family business could be secured. Later, when Willow insisted on having a child, her parents emphasized that if it were a boy, they would let him take the Lu family name. So, David's last name being Wong instead of Lu wasn't because of me, it was because Willow didn't want to give in to her parents, I suppose. As David grew up, he learned to make choices, he understood that between family interests and the father who raised him, he knew which one to choose. Chapter 11. It was Mary's first time in this world, and she was curious about everything. She pressed her face against the window, pointing at things left and right. She kept asking me, Daddy, what's that tower? And what's that over there? I simply took her hand and led her downstairs. Daddy will take you out to see. She hopped along behind me, but as soon as we stepped outside, I ran into an old colleague and his child. During my first time crossing into this world, I had lived here for many years. I became a professional interior designer, I had a job, friends, and a career of my own. Thanks to my good reputation, my performance in the industry was quite good. When my friend saw me, he immediately grabbed my hand. His voice was full of surprise. George, where have you been these past few years? He paused and then added. Since you left, our company's performance has declined a lot. We haven't secured any major contracts in years. Now we've finally got a new project. No way, I can't let you leave. You have to come with me to check it out. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I was only staying for a month. How could I have the energy to get involved in work again? So I smiled helplessly and spent some time politely refusing. Mary was standing nearby. She waited a long time and started getting impatient. Unable to wait any longer, she ran off to play with my colleague's daughter. The girl was in middle school, around 14 or 15, and the two of them hit it off right away. Playing together, they ran off into the distance. My friend joked. Let my daughter take yours to play. They're in the same neighborhood anyway. She's lived here for over 10 years and knows everyone. She can help her get familiar with the place. Don't worry. The neighborhood wasn't big, and it was gated. This friend was someone I was close to, a good brother I kept in touch with in this world. I didn't think there would be any problems. But just 10 minutes later, my friend's phone rang. It was his daughter. Dad. Uncle. Come quick. Someone's fighting with Mary. Chapter 12. Calling it a fight wasn't accurate, Mary was being bullied one-sidedly. My friend and I had just finished talking, agreeing to meet at the office in a few days, but after receiving the call, we both rushed over. It wasn't far, just near the flowerbed over there. In a small sandy area, Mary was pinned down by a boy who looked about 10 years old. He was throwing punches at her while yelling all sorts of nasty things. My friend's daughter was desperately pulling at the boy's arm, trying to get him off, but whether it was because she wasn't strong enough or the boy was determined to fight, he didn't budge, until we arrived. Seeing this scene, my head buzzed. Mary never got into trouble. On the contrary, she was gentle and cheerful, had many friends, and was well-liked. I was filled with regret. Why had I let her out of my sight on the first day back? Without hesitation, I rushed forward, grabbing the boy by the back of his collar and throwing him aside. Are you okay? Does anything hurt? Why were you fighting? I was too anxious. All I could think about was Mary's condition. I didn't even glance at the other child. Without thinking, I had just tossed him away. In the corner of my eye, I saw the boy sitting on the ground, rubbing his knees. He didn't move, just sat there, dazed, head down, looking lost, as if he didn't know what to do. Chapter 13. I'm okay. Daddy. Mary reached out her arm, gently touching my cheek. He didn't hit me. He just wanted to take something from me. The pendant you gave me. Do you remember? The pendant. The gift I gave her shortly after she was born last year. It was a small wooden carving I made myself. It wasn't worth much, so why would he try to take it? I lifted my head. This was the first time I looked at the boy properly. He was wearing a black shirt and a baseball cap. He had kept his head down, but now, as if sensing my gaze, he looked up at me. The cold, detached expression on his face suddenly turned into one of hurt. He stood up and walked toward me, pulling Mary away from my side. His voice was soft but persistent, repeating the same words over and over again. Dad, it's you. Dad. You came back for David, didn't you? When I left David, he was only six, just about Mary's age. Now, seven years had passed, and he was already thirteen. Even though there were still traces of his old self in his features, I found it hard to recognize him at first glance. Couldn't the system have given me a picture of what he looks like now? 
I was stunned, realizing that what had just happened was probably the first time I had ever laid a hand on him, but David didn't seem to care, he just stretched out his hand, and in his palm was the pendant, wasn't this the gift you gave me before, dad, why does she have one too, she must have stolen it, I hit her, so what's wrong with that, chapter 14, I did give David a pendant like that, when he was born, he fell ill, and we had many doctors treat him, I carved that pendant as a symbol of peace, hoping for comfort, and hung it around his neck, when he was little, he liked it quite a bit, often holding it in his hands and staring at it, as he grew older and made friends of higher status, he probably began to think it was beneath him, once, after returning from the Liu family's old mansion, the pendant was gone, in its place was a jade pendant, when I asked him about it, David frowned and looked at me dismissively, but my friends all say that kind of pendant is worthless, for people like us, wearing something like that is embarrassing, I sighed, when David called Mary a thief, of course, Mary wasn't happy, she almost jumped in frustration, who stole your stuff, this was always mine, you're the one who took it, you took what my dad gave me, something in Mary's words must have hit a nerve in David, like a lion with its mane raised, he lifted his fist again, what did you say, say it again, who's your dad, he's not your dad, the system was right, over the past few years, David had grown extreme, sharp, and harsh, he wasn't like this before, I stopped his actions and scolded him, shut your mouth, Mary is my daughter, and if you dare touch your sister again, you'll regret it, chapter 15, sister, David's expression went blank for a moment, dad only had one child, me, not anymore, I stood up, I snatched the pendant from David's hand and returned it to Mary, this was something I had carved with my own hands for my daughter, no one could take it away in front of me, David hung his head, he looked down at his empty hand, confused, I asked him, David, why are you here? Isn't anyone watching you? Where's your mom? In my mind. I thought that after I left this world, Willow and Makoto would have married quickly, they would live peacefully as a family of three in the Lu family's villa, and no one would think of me again, but now. I didn't understand why David was here alone, with no adults around. My friend, noticing my ignorance, walked over slowly and whispered in my ear, Brother Wong, you really don't know, do you? Although I'm not part of the upper circles, I've heard some rumors. After you left, it's said that this mother and son barely saw each other. Willow moved out of the Lu family home and barely looked at the child. What kind of mother is that? It's shocking, a mother who doesn't love her own child. I took a deep breath and looked down at David. He was clutching my shirt, looking up at me with his red lips moving. Answering my question from earlier, today someone called grandpa's house, and I picked up. They said someone was trying to rent apartment 728 in this neighborhood and wanted to ask grandpa if he would rent it out. I remembered that was the apartment where we used to live as a family of three. So I asked who was renting it, and they mentioned your name, dad. That's why I snuck over here to see. He glanced at Mary, as if to say, who would have thought I'd run into this annoying pest? And as for my mom, Willow hates me. David's voice dropped. She ignores me. Dad, you won't leave me too, will you? Chapter 16. So after I left, the Lou family bought the apartment. I thought of how spotless the place was. Perhaps Willow had a habit of keeping things clean. Anyway, I would only be here for a month. It didn't matter where I stayed. But regarding David, I had to talk to Willow. If the system's goal was to prevent David from becoming a villain, then Willow's role couldn't be ignored. David was her child. After all, why would she treat him like this? As I rode in a cab with David and Mary, I couldn't help but ask out of curiosity. The three of us were squeezed into the back seat. I sat in the middle. David leaned against the window, staring outside. He responded with a lazy mm. Speaking slowly, Willow hates me. She's always thought that dad left because of me. If I hadn't made dad angry back then and caused a fight, maybe dad would have stayed. So she thinks a kid like me, who can't even keep his dad around, is worthless. After saying that, David lowered his head. He touched his neck, as if looking for the pendant he had thrown away. But, dad, I've changed. I'm doing my homework, studying hard, and my grades are great now. Grandpa even says he'll give me the company one day. If you don't like mom, I'll just get rid of her. He quietly reached out his hand, placing it in mine. Dad, don't leave this time. Okay. Chapter 17. I hadn't responded to David yet. Mary puffed up her cheeks and chimed in. Why should he? My mom is waiting for my dad at home. Dad said we're a family of three, and if you join, that's too many, so dad won't want you. David's eyes reddened instantly. He wanted to reach out and grab Mary, but when he saw the look in my eyes, he stopped. I realized that David was actually very sensitive. During the fight in the sand, he must have already sensed that I was no longer the father who only talked to him rationally. Between the two kids, he could tell I was more protective of Mary, 
although he didn't step out of line anymore. His mouth couldn't stop spewing curses. Liar. Disgusting brat. Before he could say anything else, I stopped him immediately. Don't let me hear you say one more curse word, and never speak to my daughter like that again. Understood. He glanced at me resentfully but eventually nodded. The Lu family was a powerful, wealthy clan that controlled dozens of listed companies, involved in countless industries. Even though they were reluctant, they still groomed David as an heir from a young age. Most of their businesses were handed over to Willow to manage. Standing in front of the company building, I couldn't help but wonder. That once spoiled and headstrong young lady, now forced to take over her father's company, what would she be like now? I turned to David and said, Lead the way, let's go find your mom. David wasn't wrong. The Lu family took him very seriously. He could come and go from the company as he pleased. Most of the employees didn't even blink when they saw this 13 year old boy walk by. His fingerprints were registered in the access system. He held my hand, leading me from the lobby to the top floor in a private elevator. When the assistant saw him, they were momentarily stunned. Then they bent slightly and spoke respectfully. Young master, what brings you here? Are you here to see your mom? Let me go tell her you're here. David straightened his posture and pushed the assistant gently aside. No need. If I want to come, I'll come. No need to tell her. Chapter 18. David pushed the door open and walked right in. In the spacious office, Willow was sitting at her desk, dressed in a black T-length dress that perfectly accentuated her slender figure. From my angle, I could see her profile. Compared to seven years ago, her face was almost unchanged, still delicate and beautiful. But her head was lowered, focused on her work. Her deep eyes were glued to the document in front of her her long fingers lightly turning the pages. Her face showed a faint coldness, with no extra expression. Calm and composed, there was no trace of the spoiled young lady she once was, but around her neck hung the rosewood pendant I had given her years ago. Why she still kept it, I had no idea. It seemed Willow had already heard David's voice, but she didn't even lift her head. She turned another page and said coolly, didn't I tell you not to come to me? If you need something, go to your grandpa. I'm not your nanny. I paused. Then I spoke. Willow, let's talk. For a moment, time seemed to stand still. Willow suddenly looked up but didn't speak or react. The office was silent. For a second, I wondered if she hadn't heard me. But soon, she stood up, staring at me with disbelief on her face. She knocked the documents off her desk, frantically bending down to pick them up. When she looked up again, her eyes were already red. Her voice trembled with emotion as she said. It's been seven years. I thought I was dreaming just now. George, you're back. You're not leaving. We're still a family. Right. I smiled helplessly. I didn't answer her string of questions. I simply repeated. Willow, if you have time, let's talk alone. Okay. Willow seemed to snap out of it, rubbing the corners of her eyes and giving me a gentle smile. She said. Okay, I've wanted to talk to you for so many years. Throughout the entire conversation, she never once looked at David, nor did she notice Mary, who was slowly trailing behind. She only looked at me. She said. I've kept your favorite yerba mate tea here in the office. See. She smiled brightly, picking up the gourd cup from her desk. She said, I've still kept the cup you made for me. I'll brew some for you. Chapter 19. She hadn't noticed the two children. I signaled to the assistant, asking them to find an office to take care of the kids. When I turned back, Willow had already brewed the tea. Placing it in front of me, she looked at me expectantly, but she didn't know. I hadn't liked this tea in a long time. So much had changed over time, even my habits. I pushed the cup aside. Reminded of why the system had sent me here, it was about David, about preventing him from developing an extreme, harmful personality. I could only stay here for a month. Willow's role as a mother was crucial. After some thought, I got straight to the point. Willow, I didn't come here to reminisce. I just want to ask you, why, when David loved you so much as his mother, did you treat him like this? Chapter 20. Willow had been holding her cup of tea, but when she heard my question, she paused for a moment, then gently put down the cup. She pulled out a tissue, wiping the lipstick stain from the silver filter straw. Her voice was low as she said, David, huh? She blinked sadly, then smiled self-deprecatingly and said, I always thought he made you angry, that's why you didn't stay, am I stupid? She stood up, walked over to the bookshelf, and gently pulled out an old photo of us. It seemed like she was reminiscing about the past, or perhaps imagining the future. She placed her hand on the glass, tracing it lightly, her fingers brushing over the edges of the frame. She spoke very seriously, word by word, but now things are different. Now you've come back for me. I know you blame me for being a bad mother, but I won't be anymore. She turned around, her eyes sparkling with hope as she looked at me expectantly. I'm going to marry you. From now on, the three of us will live together in harmony. We can live by the sea, in a villa, 
or we can move back to our old home. Every morning, I'll make breakfast for you and our son. We'll take David to school together, then I'll go to work, and you'll go to the office. After work, we'll come home together. As she said these words, her tone was light and airy, as if she were watching a painting unfold before her eyes. Finally, she softly asked, doesn't that sound good? Let's start over. Willow's left hand kept nervously twisting the hem of her dress. I don't think she even realized it was a signal of her anxiety. I looked at her. I raised my right hand, showing the ring on my finger. I said, I'm already married. I even have a daughter. Willow, some things just can't go back to the way they were. Chapter 21 I don't know how to describe Willow's expression at that moment. It was as if she had been plunged into icy water, her entire face turning pale. She whispered, in disbelief. What did you say? You're lying to me. George, if you're married, then what about me? What about David? We're a family of three. What are we? Then, how can you go and start a new family with someone else? It was at this moment. The office door suddenly burst open. Mary peeked in, her head poking through. Behind her was the assistant, who hadn't managed to stop her, and David, who glared at her with hostility. Daddy. She bounced into my arms. It's already five o'clock, and I'm hungry. We should go eat. And we've been out all day. When are we going home? Mom's still waiting for us. Chapter 22 The assistant lightly tapped Mary's shoulder. Little one, this is an office. You can't just run in here. Mary ignored him. She looked at David, then at Willow. She asked. She's your mom, right? Even though she's pretty, she looks really mean. My dad likes gentle women. Like my mom. If Willow hadn't noticed Mary before. After hearing her say, Daddy, Daddy. It was impossible for her not to understand the connection between me and this child. Willow's expression darkened instantly. She stared at Mary without blinking, her gaze deepening as if she wanted to pierce through her. Mary, however, didn't care about her look. She didn't care who this person was, nor did she care how strange this world was or how many strangers surrounded her. She had even forgotten that I had told her we would be gone for a month. All she knew was that a day away from home felt like a long time, and she remembered only one thing, that dad was by her side and she couldn't let anyone take him away. So she said, Come on, Dad, let's go home. She grabbed my hand and looked up at me, suddenly sniffing the air. There's such a strong tea smell. Dad, didn't you say you don't like tea? I turned back to look at Willow, leaning against the bookshelf. I said slowly. When I found David, he was alone, so I brought him here. I came to tell you that. I received information that if David continues like this, his future development could go down the wrong path. I can't stay in this world for long. You're his mother, so I feel it's my duty to remind you. Willow gave a soft MM, lowering her head, looking completely dejected. Just as I was about to walk away, she suddenly called out to me, George, do you really not like Yerba Mate tea? I smiled and said, You liked it. A lot of the things I used to like were just to accommodate you. Chapter 23 Since the system had already signed the lease for this apartment and paid the deposit, there was no need for me to move out. One day, I remembered my colleague's request by chance. So I took a taxi to the company. I had always been treated well there. So since I had nothing else to do, I figured I'd help out a bit. I gave some guidance on a few project designs. Luckily, the company had a childcare facility. While I was helping with the design, Mary had someone to look after her. During this time, Willow didn't contact me again. Not that it was surprising. Now that everyone knew I had a wife, if she reached out, would she want to be the other woman? David, on the other hand, came by almost every day. It was summer vacation, and he didn't have much to do. He always carried a small backpack, with a few workbooks inside, and quietly sat next to my desk. He worked through his problems one by one. If an old friend who knew about my connection to the Lou family happened to pass by, they might stop and glance at him, maybe even compliment him. George, your son seems really well behaved. He doesn't talk much, and from what I saw, his answers are almost all correct, impressive. Whenever that happened, David would proudly pull out his test papers. Thank you, uncle. I was the top of my class last time, and my teacher praised me. He'd scoot over to me, holding his papers up like a treasure for me to see. Dad, I scored almost perfect in all subjects, especially in math. My teacher even recommended I compete in the math competition. He'd sneak a glance at me. I understand now. If you want to inherit the company, you have to be excellent in school. I knew what he was thinking of. It was the scolding I had given him seven years ago over a few math problems. Back then, I had told him. Since we're all going to die anyway, why bother struggling to live? Clearly, he still hadn't grasped the deeper meaning of that question. I sighed, not sure what to say, so I just nodded and ruffled his hair. That's great, your grandparents must be proud of you. David didn't respond, 
He seemed to avoid mentioning anyone from the Liu family in front of me. After a while, he clung to my arm and changed the subject. Dad, my birthday is in a few days. What are we going to do? Chapter 24 When the driver came to pick David up, he asked if I remembered when his birthday was. As he asked, David's eyes were filled with both nervousness and anticipation. Of course, I remembered. Not only because the system had told me that at midnight after his birthday, I could return to my original world, but also because David was my first child. I had spent so many years here, I had genuinely cared for him. How could I forget that so easily? I helped him put on his backpack, smiling gently. Of course, I remember. I won't forget. The car drove off into the distance. David sat in the front passenger seat. He looked back at me. It was the first time I had seen him smile like that. Bright, cheerful, and sunny. Dad. He waved at me. Can you get me a gift for my birthday? He paused, then carefully added. I'll get you a gift too, Dad. Chapter 25. When I turned around, I saw that Mary had already come out of the childcare center. She was carrying her little bag, standing behind me. When she saw me turn, she quickly ran over and grabbed my hand. Dad. Let's go home and eat. I couldn't help but laugh at Mary's persistence about meals. On the way home, I brought up David. Do you still not like him? Mary nodded, then shook her head. She scratched her chin, making a thoughtful expression. At first, I didn't like him because he hit me for no reason. But now, I think he's a little pitiful. Mary nodded seriously, then added thoughtfully. Because even I can tell that dad doesn't want to stay here. And he keeps asking you to make decisions you don't want to make. Chapter 26 I had originally planned to give David another pendant as his birthday gift. Every time he saw Mary, his eyes would always linger on the red string around her neck. He'd reach out his hand and then put it back down. I had a feeling that if I hadn't strictly forbidden it, he might have already started another fight and snatched it from her. So I bought the materials and planned to carve a new one myself at home. But after stumbling through the process halfway, I realized I had forgotten how to make it. Just like the countless other moments when I realized, time had changed everything, and it felt like there was no going back. That morning, on the last day, I frowned at the half-finished pendant in my hand. I finally decided to buy a ready-made gift instead. I threw on my coat and hurried out the door, but when I opened it, I was met with someone unexpected. It was Willow. Someone who had hardly appeared in front of me since I arrived in this world. She was sitting on the ground by the wall, head lowered, and I had no idea how long she'd been waiting. The moment she heard the door open, she jumped to her feet, looking at me with eyes full of hope. She forced a smile and said, George, today is David's birthday. Can we celebrate together, the three of us? It's been so long since we had a meal together as a family. Let's book a table at David's favorite restaurant. Okay. Since I wasn't going to be here much longer, I didn't want to argue over Willow's words anymore. I checked my watch and nodded. That's fine. But let's skip the restaurant. I already ordered takeout. But we'll have to wait until the afternoon. Right now. I'm going to buy him a gift. I adjusted my briefcase and headed towards the elevator. I heard footsteps behind me. Willow was following me. I haven't bought David's gift either. Let's go together. She paused, then added. Besides, I have something I want to talk to you about. Chapter 27. In the car, she was clutching the hem of her dress tightly, her fingers constantly fidgeting. She had said she wanted to talk to me, but she hadn't said a word the entire ride. It wasn't until we were pulling into the mall parking lot that Willow finally couldn't hold back. She unbuckled her seatbelt, smoothing out the wrinkles in her dress. Her gaze seemed to flicker over to the ring on my finger. Slowly, in a soft voice, she asked. George. I've been thinking about what you said, about us not being able to go back. Is that really true? Even if you're married and have a child, that all happened in another world. If you stayed here, we could pretend you never left, that you never met anyone else. As for Mary, you know I've always wanted a daughter. If you love her, I can love her too. I can treat her like my own. I won't let her suffer. As Willow said this, her expression was incredibly serious. So serious, in fact, that there was a faint, almost tangible sense of obsession in her tone. I looked at her in disbelief. Willow, you sound like you're offering to be my secret mistress. She suddenly laughed and said. If you're willing to stay, I don't care what people say about me. We could get married in this world. George, wouldn't that be good? I got out of the car, shut the door, all in one swift motion. No, I said firmly, enunciating each word. My wife is still waiting for me. You'll never know how much better she is than you. Chapter 28. Willow sat there, stunned in the car. Her head lowered as she stared at the rose pendant around her neck. When I was pursuing Willow, I gave her many wooden carvings. Back then, she said she loved this pendant the most, and she never took it off, always wearing it around her neck. But by the end, she stopped wearing it. After all, compared to her luxurious necklaces, 
This handmade piece seemed far too cheap. Eventually, she even forgot where she had put it. Now that I think about it, families like the Lu family do care a lot about appearances. It wasn't just Willow. During those years, I must have heard David complain countless times. He always said, It's too cheap. Dad, you're embarrassing me. People will laugh at me if they see this. Why are you dressed like that when we go out? Dad, look at other people's watches. It was as if only by shedding his true self and putting on a layer of glitz and glamour could he finally squeeze into that enviable circle. For the Lu family, letting me into that circle was the ultimate favor. I took a deep breath, walking past a luxury store. I pointed to a pendant and said to the clerk, Wrap that up, please. It's for a birthday gift. Since the system was paying, I might as well give a gift that matched their status. Chapter 29 When I finished buying the gift and walked out of the mall, I was surprised to find Willow still there. She was waiting at the entrance, seemingly back to her usual self. George, let's go find David. She got back into the car, acting as if we hadn't just had an argument. Let's celebrate his birthday together, please. The last word. She said it so softly. I glanced at her, puzzled. I'd only been here for a month, but it was clear to me that her relationship with David wasn't great. If this could somehow bring them closer together, then maybe it wouldn't be such a waste after all. I said, all right. The birthday celebration was simple. Just the four of us and a table of food. I had ordered some takeout, and I personally cooked a few dishes. It wasn't too different from how Hannah and I celebrated Mary's birthday. Mary was particularly well behaved today, probably because she knew she'd be seeing her mom again soon. She sat quietly in the corner, not causing any trouble. Watching as I handed David his gift, put the cardboard crown on his head, and pushed the cake in front of him. You're 14 now. I lit the candles one by one. David, make a wish. Chapter 30. Mary stood up and flicked off the lights with a clap. In the dim glow of the candles, David's face was softly illuminated. His hands clasped in front of him. He looked at me. Dad, can I wish for anything? Before I could answer, he spoke. I wish for Dad to stay with me forever. In the silence, I looked back at him. David had asked me many times if I could stay, and I had told him. It wasn't possible, because there was someone else waiting for me in another world. I shook my head. David, make another wish. But David, for once was unusually stubborn. No, I want this one. For the entire time I'd been back, he had been so well behaved, trying hard to show me he wasn't the same as before. Now, all of a sudden, it was like he had become a different person, pointing at Mary with jealousy in his eyes. She's already had you for so long. Dad, is she going to have you forever too? If she wants to stay, I don't care, but why should she? David's eyes reddened. And he said slowly, why should she take my dad? Chapter 31. I glanced at Willow. She hadn't said a word this entire time, as if she were letting David's emotions spiral out of control. Mary, who had been quietly sitting the whole time, clenched her little fists and stood up. I'm not taking dad away. He was mine to begin with. You didn't even want him. I wasn't sure which of her words triggered David. He shoved the cake aside and jumped to his feet. He stumbled over to the cabinet where I kept my things and pulled out a small box. Inside was the phone the system had given me to return to my world. His expression was full of hurt, but his feet carried him backward. It's all mom's fault for treating dad badly. Don't blame me, dad. I know you use this to communicate with the other world. If I get rid of it, does that mean you won't leave? He leaned out the window, about to toss the box away. I jumped up immediately, running towards him, while frantically calling out to the system. Hey, hey, system, where are you? You were right, this kid's dark side is something else. I'm not going to get stuck here, am I? The familiar electronic hum buzzed in my ears. As if the signal had cut off. I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was almost midnight. David turned around. He tried to force a smile at me. Don't worry, Dad. I'll become a great man one day. I won't let you down. I shook my head. David, maybe some goals can't be achieved, but that doesn't make the effort meaningless. Life isn't about living forever, so dying doesn't mean failure. And studying doesn't have to be about inheriting the company, so not inheriting it doesn't make learning pointless. What I want to tell you is that I won't be disappointed. I don't need you to be a great man. I just want to see you become a good person. I looked into his confused eyes, wondering if he understood the connection, just as I was debating whether to explain further. The doorbell suddenly rang. Chapter 32. The doorbell kept ringing, as if it wouldn't stop. Even Willow, who had been sitting all this time, stood up. I went to open the door, and to my surprise, it was Hannah. She held out her hand to me. Come on, honey, let's go home. The system, which had been silent for so long, finally appeared. It was the same familiar mechanical voice. Sorry. Host, I was just talking with your wife, before you crossed over, we had an agreement. If there was ever a special circumstance that might prevent you from returning home in time, she would be given a chance, 
to come here, I remembered, back then. Hannah held my hand and said, if something happens, then I'll come to that world and bring you back, George, now. She was standing right outside the door, Mary, who hadn't seen her mother in a month, leaped into her arms like a rabbit coming home after a long absence, the narrow doorframe felt like a boundary, separating two worlds, on one side were Hannah and Mary, on the other, Willow and David, Willow looked at Hannah, her lips pressed into a thin line, and her voice was almost panicked, George, are you leaving again? I gripped Hannah's hand tightly and nodded, we won't meet again after this, Willow, this is the end for us, epilogue chapter 1, Willow knew that she and her son hated each other, after George left for the first time, she searched for him for a long time. Many of her friends told her it wasn't worth it. You can't find a three-legged toad, but there are plenty of two-legged men. If he wants to leave, let him who can't live without someone. At first, Willow thought the same. He wasn't from a wealthy family, not part of the elite. It seemed like the only thing he had to offer was his devotion to her. He was just an ordinary man. So how could someone like him leave her? She couldn't understand it. Eventually, she directed her frustration at David. Yes. It had to be because of him. It had to be because this son listened to his grandfather and said something that made George disappointed. This child had never been likable. He was useless. If he were useful, couldn't he have made his father stay? When David cried and asked her why his father had disappeared, Willow sneered, isn't it because you always made him angry, and that's why he didn't want you anymore? David's sobs paused. After a while, he looked up, hatred burning in his eyes. That's not true. Dad didn't leave me. He left you, you weren't even married, he just wanted to go. Chapter 2 When George left for the second time, Willow stood there, watching as he crossed that door. He left with his wife and child, and there was nothing she could do. David came running from the window, shouting for his father, Dad, take me with you. Don't leave me behind again. Willow coldly watched him fuss and cry, but he couldn't hold on to anything. The door quickly closed. She knew, of course that he couldn't leave for good, they didn't have the system, there was no way for them to travel between the worlds. She reached out, pulling David back, with a sneer, she said, your dad's gone with his little daughter, he doesn't want you anymore, so stop throwing a fit. David sniffed and shook off Willow's hand, he stood up and walked over to the table, opening the gift George had given him, he mumbled softly, I wonder what dad gave me, is it the pendant he carved himself? He carefully unwrapped it, oh, it was just a luxury necklace he bought on the spot. David froze for a moment, he must have been disappointed, but quickly, as if to comfort himself, he smiled, it's okay, I'll like anything dad gives me, I'll keep it forever. Chapter 3, before contacting George, the system detected that, based on David's current trajectory, he was very likely to blacken into a major villain, for the sake of the stability of the world, the system reached out to him, hoping it might help, at this moment, the system felt so grateful, that it had once used its own points to save George's life, throughout the month. The system often observed George's interactions with David. It noticed that in front of his long-lost father, David's personality showed a stark contrast. He hid his malice, prejudice, arrogance, and rudeness, and did his best to show only his gentle and well-behaved side. It was as if he were a monster wrapped in golden foil, nice on the outside, but terrifying inside, until the last day, when George was about to leave. That's when David could no longer keep up the act, and he completely exploded. By the time George left, David's blackening value was incredibly high. Other systems came by to watch the scene and bet that this child would surely grow up to become a villain. The system thought for a moment, and said no. Because of George's question and his final words, I don't need you to become a great person. I just hope you grow up to be a good person. About 20 years later, the system remembered this little world again and went back to check. By this time, David had taken over the Lou family's company with decisive and efficient methods. Willow had left the company, keeping only her shares. The mother and son still rarely saw each other. David was cold and lonely, with almost no friends around him. People described him like this. He didn't seem to have done anything evil, but he didn't seem happy either. His personality so withdrawn it was as if he had forgotten how to smile. 